trying not to be a big crybaby up here, but I'm just so excited to see young people worshiping the Lord. And I said to them, said to them in rehearsal that you don't have to know every single scripture. But if you know these three things in this song, you can lead someone to Christ because in the way that you bless his name, when you praise him, and then it says, embrace your glory, meaning don't run from God, embrace him. When the Lord is trying to minister to you in worship, don't fight that back. Allow those tears to flow. Embrace his glory. But here's the big one. Change my ways and humble myself before thee. These are the things I can do to honor you. And if people see me live like that, they'll know that you're real. It doesn't matter if I know scripture. If they know how I live my life, they'll see your word in how I live. Would you stand to your feet as we go into the word of God? Hallelujah. Give them another hand. Do you mind? Hallelujah. Um, I want you to get your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 20. Uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We're going to begin at the 17th verse. Luke chapter 10, beginning at the 17th verse. I'll be reading to you from the Kendall Wyatt Standard Revised Version of the Bible. So it might be a little different from your Bible, but it'll be close to what's written in your Bible. It says this, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 says, The 72 returned with joy. And they said, Jesus, even demons submitted to us when we used your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you because of the authority I've given you. However, do not rejoice that demons and demonic spirits obey you. Don't rejoice that they submit to you. Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Verse number 20. Don't rejoice that you've overcome your enemies. Don't rejoice because you've overcome the devil. Don't rejoice because you build a new house. Don't rejoice because you got a brand new car. Don't rejoice because now you're making mid six figures. But rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. God, we thank you and we bless you. Thank you for this opportunity to stand before your people. Thank you for this chance, God. I pray, God, that if there's anything in me that would keep me from delivering this word the way you gave it to me, God, I pray that you remove it from me right now. God, I am a sinner. I'm just a sinner saved by your grace. God, I pray that if there's anything in me, God, remove it. I want to deliver this meal with clean hands. God, I pray, God, that you'll hide me behind the cross so that your people can only see you stretched out, dying for our sins on that cross. God, I speak the name Jesus into the atmosphere of this room because your word says that at the name of Jesus, that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that you are Lord. So I speak the name Jesus in this room and the names doubt, despair, divorce, sickness, sadness, trouble, trauma, trial have to bow at the name of Jesus. So I speak the name Jesus in this room. God, I pray that you'll rule and super rule in this house. God, get the glory out of us today. God, guard these words from my mouth to their ears so that Satan will not come along and steal away the seed of the word that I know you want me to share today. God, Father, I lift my cup up. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you have your seat? Would you help me preach this today? Will you look at somebody and say, the book? The book. The book. The book. Uh, a few years ago, uh, those of you that don't know yet, it's like a dirty little secret here at our church, that my sister is Kiki Wyatt. You're like, I don't know who that is anyway. Great. Wonderful. That way I don't have to ask for nothing. So uh, my sister is Kiki Wyatt. She is an R&B singer. 
um, pretty popular R&B singer. She's not Beyonce, but she is a star. And so a few years ago, ooh, y'all gonna be tough today, it looks like. Um, but a few years ago, um, my sister had an opportunity to be on this show called R&B Divas. A show called, yeah, anybody see that show? Okay, just don't, don't judge her for it. Just let her, you know, just let her be great. Um, so she was on a show called R&B Divas, and uh, when, the, when the show was premiering, they had a premiere party in Atlanta. So a lot of times when these new shows start, um, sometimes in Hollywood or Atlanta, or sometimes in Miami, they'll have premiere parties where the people on the show will invite their friends and they'll have a big party to celebrate the new season or the start of this TV show. So we went to the premiere party down in Atlanta and uh, we all went down there and um, piled up on my sister and it was uh, at her house. My sister has a beautiful house. I think it's like about seven bedrooms, like six bathrooms, like 7,500 square feet. It's an amazing house in Atlanta. And so we all went down there to pile up on my sister. And it was a momentous occasion for our family because my sister had been in an abusive marriage. And we didn't know it because he's still living that, and we didn't know because he'd be dead. But, um, but she was in an abusive marriage. And yeah, catch that on your way home. Just forgive me for that. But, but we, were, we were going down there to celebrate with her because even though, it was, even though it was the start of a new show, it was in some regards a start of a new chapter in my sister's life. She had to take a step back because she had gone through this very difficult divorce, a lot of abuse and some drug abuse and other things going on over there. And she had to, she had to come back and, and kind of get her life back together. So we were excited for her. And I remember us being at my sister's house and outside the house, there pulled up this wonderful, like, looked like it was 30 feet long, a stretch limousine. At that time, it was a Hummer limousine that pulled up. And so there was a bunch of people in my sister's house, and they all got in the, tr in the limousine, and the neighbors were coming out taking pictures, and everybody was excited because we're going downtown Atlanta to the TV One building for this premiere party. So everybody starts getting in the, uh, in the truck, and some, not all of us could fit. So the truck went on ahead, and I rode downtown Atlanta with one of my favorite cousins, and he had just came home from the Army. He was over and over in, in, in Afghanistan. He came home, and he had his Mercedes S Coupe with him. Oh, Jesus. He had his Mercedes. Y'all missing all of it. It's Atlanta. We're single. He has his Mercedes S Coupe. We are fronting big time down there. So we went downtown Atlanta. We looking good, smelling good. We get to the TV One building. And when I get to the door, I see a good friend of mine named Lillian Lee. Now, Lillian Lee, I was excited for her. Excuse me. I was excited for Lillian because Lillian had just gotten a part on that show, um, Soul Man. I don't know if y'all remember that. Uh, Cedric the Entertainer had a show called Soul Man. Well, she, was, she got a part on that show, and she was moving to L.A. So I saw her. I was like, Lillian, I'm so excited for you. You got a new part. You're about to move to L.A. Your life is taking off. I'm so excited. I'm excited for her. And then I told her, I said, man, I want to get upstairs to this party with my sister. It was on the 22nd floor of the, uh, of the TV One building. There's a terrace out there. Wonderful. I said, Lillian, I love to see you, chick, but you got to get out the way. I want to get to this party. And look what Lillian said to me. She was a host at the door. This is what she said. She said, Kendall, I know who you are, but let me check the book to make sure that your name is written in it. Because if your name is not written in the book, even though I know you, you can't go upstairs to the celebration. <laughs> Dang. I only had half of y'all shout. I thought I was going to be able to say that. Y'all was going to run. We was going to be able to go home. I was going to tell pastor. I told them one story, pastor, and they ran. But this is kind of what Jesus was telling his disciples in Luke chapter 10. He was explaining to them, I don't want you to rejoice over what you have accomplished. I want to rejoice because I wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life. Before I, before I explain exactly what Jesus was doing in this text, can I give you a little context to Luke chapter 10? If you go to the top of Luke chapter 10, what you'll find is that Jesus has sent out 72 of his followers to go out and minister. And what he asked them to do was he told them to go out preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel with people. And what he said to them was tell them what, what they were supposed to do, excuse me, was to tell people that the kingdom of God was at hand and that Jesus was on the way. Jesus was in another city, but he was heading to these cities and they were supposed to tell people the kingdom of God is at hand and Jesus is on the way. You're going to catch it in a minute. Their job was to go out and tell people that the kingdom of God is at hand and that Jesus is on the way. 
So Jesus sent them out to these places, sent them, sent them to, into these houses and to, to give that message that the kingdom of God is at hand and that Jesus is on the way. The reason why Jesus did this is because some of these places he's about to go to, this, this, excuse me, this is the last time he's going to go to those places before he is crucified on the cross. And I, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because I want to encourage somebody in this room that you may not know Jesus and the pardon of your sins. Well, let me help you today. The kingdom of God is at hand and Jesus is on the way. And you don't know if you're in this room and you have not accepted Christ as your personal savior. This might be the last time Jesus comes through here. So you better give your life to Christ. And the day you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. If you're in this room and you don't know God, the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus is coming again soon. So I want to point something out to you that Jesus sent 72. But there are many theologians that believe that there was about 120 that was with Jesus all the time. So there's about 120, many theologians believe, there's about 120 that are following Jesus all the time. But he only sends 72. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because there are 120 followers of Christ, but only 72 that are prepared to go and tell the world that the kingdom of God is at hand and that Jesus is on the way. This is the reason why you got to come to Bible study. This is the reason why you got to come to Sunday school, because you want to be one of the 72 that go out and tell people that the kingdom of God is at hand and that Jesus is on the way. We don't want to have a church full of the full 120. We want to have a church full of the 72 that are equipped to go and tell people about the gospel. So Jesus had 120 that followed him. He had 72 that he sent out. They were sent out to say the kingdom of God is at hand and that Jesus is on the way. Jesus said this, when you get to certain houses, they won't receive you. He said, when you get to certain places, if you look through Luke chapter 10, they're not going to receive you. He said, but if you go into a place and they don't receive you, he said, take the sandals off your feet, shake the dust off your Air Force Ones and go on to the next place because there's somebody that wants to hear the gospel. And I've been guilty of this, that we start to have arguments with people who will never accept Christ. And there's somebody who needs to hear this message that Jesus saves. So when you go to a house, when you go to a coworker, when you go to a family member and they won't hear Christ, take your, take your stiletto heel off, take your Jordans off, dust them off and go to the next person. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Jesus is on the way and the kingdom of God is at hand. Then Jesus said, but if you come to a house and they do receive you, he said, tell them this, that the Lord has visited this house today. And the reason why he said that is because he has sent them out with his authority. Don't you know that God, because you are a child of God and because, because you have accepted him as your personal savior, that you are now authorized to go and tell the world about who Jesus is. And when you walk into a house, you represent God. So when you walk into somebody's house, when you walk into someone's establishment, when you walk into some business, you need to tell your boss, look, you need to be glad I'm here because I brought the Lord in here with me today. You can't see who just walked in here. You can't see that I brought the Lord with me. You ought, you ought to, listen, you ought to ask me nicely for those copies, Mr. Supervisor. Because God has given a certain authority to those of us that have accepted him. He has given us a certain level of authority that we walk with the authority of God. And that's why you don't need to abuse the authority of God. That's why when you're talking to your wife because you have a certain authority that you don't abuse the way that you speak to your wife. That's why when you, are a, when you are a wife that you don't abuse the way that you speak to your husband because there's a certain level of authority given to you by God as a wife. This is the reason why we shouldn't tempt our children to wrath because there's a certain authority that God has given me. I don't have to yell at you and fuss at you and we slamming doors and all that. No, we're going to sit and talk to make sure that you understand, first of all, that God has given me this level of authority and this is how it's going to be. Y'all not saying amen to that? Let me move on. So Jesus said, when you go into a house and they receive you, tell them uh, this house is blessed because God has visited this house today. But the other thing he told them to do is he said, spend some time with them sharing the word, share the word with them. He said, and then also lay hands on the sick, lay hands on broken marriages, lay hands on broken relationships, lay hands on broken homes. And what you will find is that though that the people will recover, they will get better. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because what Jesus said is he wanted them to minister to them, not only from a gospel level, but also on a social level. 
that it's hard sometimes for people to receive the word when they got a stomach that's growling. That it's hard for people to receive the word when they have a heart that's moaning and groaning because it's been broken. So Jesus said, when you go into houses, I want you to minister to them. And notice what, notice what the text says if you read in your own personal private time with God. What Jesus says is what you will notice is that everything that you're praying for, the, the sin conditions that they, excuse me, the sicknesses that they deal with or the hardships that they deal with are attached to a sin condition. Jesus says to them, it's true, that all sickness and all trouble and all trauma is attached to sin. Y'all looking at me like you don't believe me. Well, go with me to Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, the Bible says, the Bible says that when Eve and Adam ate the fruit, that, that, that death, came into the, death came into the equation. That enmity, that, that sin, that trouble, that trauma came into the world when Adam and Eve fell. But Jesus came to reverse what Adam and Eve did. So Jesus said, when you go into these houses, minister to them understanding that the fact that they cannot set the bottle down is not a physical condition as much as it is a spiritual condition. That the fact that they can't set the needle down is more about a spiritual condition than it is a physical condition. The fact that they can't stop watching porn. The fact that your husband won't come home at night. The fact that you sipping wine with your friends gossiping is not so much about a physical condition. Y'all not going to say amen at all. It's not so much about your physical condition as it is your spiritual condition. So Jesus said, if you want to get them to a place where they are past this physical thing, help them to understand the deeper, the deeper issue, which is the spiritual condition. And what you tell them is the kingdom of God is at hand, but don't worry, Jesus is on the way. And I want to encourage somebody in this room that your marriage is not in the best place right now. The kingdom of God is at hand. He is here with us now. And I promise you, if you just hang on a little bit longer in that marriage, that Jesus will come and make it all right. Somebody ought to say amen to that. And notice as we pick up Luke chapter 10, verse 17, look what happens. After all that stuff happens, after they laying hands on people, after they're telling them that the kingdom of God is at hand and that Jesus is on the way, and after they take the, the, the sandals off and knock the dust off their feet when people wouldn't accept them, they come back to Jesus with a good report in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And look what they say. The 72 returned and they said, Lord, even demons trembled and obeyed us when we started calling your name don't you know the power that god has given you as a child of god that you don't have to sit in your house and let certain things go you can stand there in the middle of your house and say i plead the blood of jesus in this house i plead that i take command over this situation satan you have no foothold in this house i'm pleading the blood over my wife my children my grandchildren everything that walks up in here is covered by your blood because of the anointing and the authority that God has given us. They said, Jesus, we went into these houses and, and even demons obeyed us. And then, he, and then they, and Jesus said, look, what Je look at Jesus' response. He wasn't trying to bust their bubble. He was trying to show them something. He said, watch this. I saw Satan fall out of heaven like a lightning bolt across the sky. You're talking to me about demons, but let me tell you, let me raise you one to Satan himself. I saw Satan fall out of heaven like a lightning bolt across the sky, down to this earth. He is a defeated foe. Can I share a joke with y'all? Uh, when I was a youth pastor, I told them uh, that I think what happened with the dinosaurs, can I tell you what happened with the dinosaurs? This is what I think happened with the dinosaurs. Okay, so there's like, oh Lord. So Satan was up in heaven talking nonsense to God, right, getting beside himself. And uh, he thought he was going to get next to God and get some of God's authority and some of his power, right? And I believe that Michael and Gabriel threw his big old big head out of heaven. And he went across the sky like this and it hit the earth's crust and then all the dinosaurs died. I think that's what happened to the dinosaurs. Because Satan got his big head thrown out of heaven. And let me encourage you on that. You will never, ever, ever, ever be smarter than God. You'll never be greater than God. So these people that, these people, young people, when you get on YouTube and they tell you there's the God in me. I am God. No, you are not God. Because who wants to say, think about this. You're God, but you got to go to work to have somebody else give you money to pay your light bill. Forgive me. I'd rather believe that there's somebody up in heaven that's greater than me. That he got all the money and he can get me some. That was just for free. That wasn't even in my sermon. He said, I saw Satan fall out of heaven like a lightning bolt across the sky down to this earth. He is a defeated foe. 
Look what Jesus says in verse number 19. He said, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and tread on scorpions. In a real sense, what Jesus was saying is, can't you see what I've done for you? I've given you the power to walk on stuff that when others walks on it, it kills them. Oh, no, 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 no. Your mama died at 62 and you are 73 still living because God gave you the power to walk on stuff that others die from. They get stung by it. They get ate up by it. You and your husband been married for 30 years and they're friends of y'all's that got divorced three years in. And you're saying, how are we able to do that? Why? Because God has given me the authority to walk on stuff that kills other people. How are you as a man raised by a single woman and you didn't, you're not in prison right now? Because God has given you the power to walk on stuff that when others walk on it, it eats them up. Jesus said, I don't want you to rejoice over demons obeying you. Because I saw Satan fall out of heaven like a lightning bolt across the sky down to this earth. Can't you see what I've done for you? I've given you the power to walk on stuff that should kill somebody. Y'all not saying amen at all in here. I've given you the, let me give it to you like this. I don't know how it's possible for a young man to be born of an immigrant father, be raised by a single mother in Hawaii, who then gets sick and then takes that son to his grandparents in Kansas. And then his grandparents raise him the rest of the way and then send him on to Harvard. And then he, then he becomes the president of the Harvard Law Review. And then he leaves the Harvard Law Review, goes to the south side of Chicago, becomes a community organizer, runs for Congress and fails. But then, watch this, meets a Michelle. And then when he meets his Michelle, then he runs for Senate and makes it. And then after two years, say, daggone it, I'm going to run for president of the United States and then become the first black president of the United States. I don't know how that works, but what I do know is that when God gives you the authority, you can walk on stuff that everybody else dies from. Can't you see what I've done for you? I don't want you to rejoice because demons obey you. I don't even want you to rejoice over the fact that I've given you the power to walk on stuff that should kill you. It killed somebody else. Why didn't you die from it? Jesus said, I don't want you to rejoice over the houses you build. Over the careers you build. Over the businesses that you build. I don't want you to rejoice over the fact that you got the finest woman in the church, because that's me. Don't rejoice over that, because I got the finest woman here. I got that one. But I want you to rejoice, watch this, because your name is written. All right, here we go. I knew y'all was going to do that. I thought y'all was going to shout. I knew you wasn't going to shout, so, I, so I, I brought this. Would you go with me? You don't believe me? Watch this. If you go with me over to the book of Revelation... The book of Revelation, John the Revelator, in, in Revelation chapter 1, John is out on this isle called Patmos. And, and what happened, the reason why John is out there, he was one of, the, one of the apostles, one of these disciples of Christ. And he was sent out to the isle of Patmos. He was beaten down and beaten up for declaring God's word. As a matter of fact, if you look at Josephus, jo the Jewish historian Josephus says that they dipped John in hot oil and then threw him out on the deserted island like Alcatraz. And they left him out there for dead. But look how John starts the book of Revelation. He says, I, John, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In the middle of my hell, in the middle of my isolation, in the middle of my trial, in the middle of my trouble, in the middle of my circumstance, I got in the spirit because it is only in the spirit that you can make sense out of the things that you're going through. There's somebody in this room right now that's going through something. You're trying to figure out why am I going through this? You're going to have to come out of your flesh and get into your spirit. You're going to have to come out of your feelings and get into your spirit so that you can understand what God is trying to reveal to you. Because if you're in isolation in this room, it's probably because God is trying to reveal something to you. Not only is God trying to reveal something to you, but he might be trying to reveal something to you for others as well. Oh, let me do this real quick. So if you're in isolation right now, won't you take that time since you're so single? Won't you take that time, young woman, and write your memoir while you're so single? 
Ain't nobody, ain't nobody inviting you out. That's fine. Write your book while you're waiting. Don't make good use of your isolation like John did. John didn't get out on isolation on, on the Isle of Patmos and get into his feelings. John got in isolation and got into his faith. And the Bible said that John said, I, John, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And it was in the middle of his personal hell that God started giving him this great revelation, not only for himself, but for us as well. Now, would you go to me with me to Revelation chapter 20? If you go to Revelation chapter 20, as John is out on that Isle of Patmos around verse 11, John says that I, John, saw a, way, a great white throne coming down out of heaven. And John said that the one who sat on the throne was in a long right robe and watch this and there was no grace in his face. You have never seen God without grace in his face. The fact that you're sitting in that pew right now is because of the grace of God. Because if you'll be honest, you know that I don't have no reason to be alive today. That, that sickness could have took me out. That crazy man I was with could have killed me. I could have died in that car accident. That plane could have went down. But God has kept me. You've never seen God without grace in his face. But the Bible says that John said that he saw a great white throne coming down out of heaven. He said, and the one who sat on the throne was in a long white robe. There was no grace in his face. There was no more grace left. Grace had run out. He was not there to extend mercy. He was there to extend judgment. And the Bible says that every tree, every bird, every insect, the fish in the sea, the beast that run in the field, your cat and your dog all turn their face in fear of the one who was sitting on the throne. Because all of the angels and all of creation knew that there was no more grace left. And John said that I saw books with an S. He said, I saw books being open. He said, and everything you did, every lie you told, everybody you slept with, when you slept with them, where you slept with them, how you slept with them, who didn't know you slept with them was going to know that. Oh, you're going to sit there and act like you ain't never done. You better quit playing with me. Because I'm going to tell you something. If God started playing our life and started reading from the books of our life, and he started reading it and putting it on this screen right here, you would be the first one. No, you'd be the second one out of here because if God started reading your life on this screen, I would run out of here first. But the Bible says that they were standing before the judgment seat of God. There was no more grace left. And everybody was hearing, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And everything you did, everything you drank, everything you smoked, every lie you told was written in those books. And people were hiding. They could not hide, but they were trying to hide, but they could not hide. And they were hearing, depart from me. And were, the Bible said there was weeping and gnashing of teeth because they knew there was no more grace left. But then John said, I, John, saw a book. Y'all don't know when to shout. John said, I saw a book. Watch this. And it was the Lamb's book. He said the only thing written in the Lamb's book were names. Y'all don't know when to shout. Not what I did, not where I went. Not what I did, not who I did it with, not how many times I did it. None of that stuff was written in the book. The only thing written in the book was the name Kendall Richard Wyatt. You don't know all the stuff I've done. I'm so glad that the stuff I've done is not written but just my name. So watch this circle all the way back to Luke chapter 10. Can't you see what I've done for you? Oh, y'all still don't get it. Mount Pleasant, y'all worrying me today. Can't you see what I've done for you? I've given you the power to walk on stuff that should kill somebody. I've given you the authority to do the right kinds of things, but here's the real reason to shout. I wrote your name down. No, no, no. I wrote your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life so that when you get to heaven and others are looking around and looking around for grace and there's no grace left, God said that you won't be looking for grace because I already wrote your name down. Oh, my, 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 my. 
Oh, Mount Pleasant, y'all worrying me today. Can I tell you something so wonderful about this book? Because it is the, watch this, he saw multiple books. Think of all the people that have ever lived. Think about all the foolishness those people have done. Those things were written down in volumes of books. But then John said, I saw one book, and that book belonged to the Lamb himself. And watch this. He said, the only thing when I took a peek over the shoulder of the angel who was holding the book, the only thing in there was names. Can I tell you something about bankruptcy? Bankruptcy is a hard thing to go through. But when you come through the other side of bankruptcy, the only thing it says is bankruptcy. It doesn't say how much you owed. It doesn't say who you owed. It doesn't say how long you owed it. The only thing it says is that you've been covered. And I love this because the names written in the book were written in ink that will never be erased. Because God took his finger that the blood dripped down and wrote my name down in that book. Y'all don't know when to shout. I'm worried about you, Mount Pleasant. Is there 10 of y'all that have been blood bought by the, by, the, by the Lamb of God? That before the foundation of the earth was laid, you realized that God wrote your name down. All right. I know we're not shouting. I think I know. Uh, the sermon was pretty quick. It's pretty quick. Uh, but y'all, yeah, half y'all didn't shout. Okay, so maybe the reason why you didn't shout is because you said, Kendall, I want to shout, man. But listen, you got to the party, but then did you ever get upstairs? <laughs> I got it. I got you. Let me finish the story. We get downtown to the TV One building. I see Lillian Lee. Remember I told you that? I see Lillian Lee. It's excited to see her. She says, Kendall, I know who you are. Let me check the book to make sure your name is written in it. Because if it's not, you can't go upstairs. Remember that? Well, she went over to check the book. And sure enough, my name was written in the book. Now, wait a minute. This is what's going to shout you. Now, if y'all don't shout off this, we just, I'm, I don't know what to say. So what happened is she goes over, she comes back. She says, yeah, Kendall, I see your name written in the book. And I said, okay. I said, but here's the thing, Lillian. I didn't write my name in that book. I'm still at home trying to get ready. Y'all forgot the fact that I missed that limousine. So I'm still back at home, still trying to get myself ready to go to the celebration. And she said, here's the thing, Kendall, your sister is the only one with the authority to write names down in this book. Is there anybody in here that's so glad that while you are here still trying to get ready to get yourself together, that Jesus died on the cross, that he went to the grave, that he stayed there for three days and three nights, and on the third day he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. And then the Bible says that Jesus ascended into heaven, and now he sits at the right hand of God the Father, and he wrote your name down, so that while you were still getting yourself ready, while you were still fixing yourself up, God wrote your name down. Is there anybody in here that's glad that God wrote your name down in the book? Oh, that ain't gonna be good enough for me. Is there anybody in here that's so glad that God wrote your name down before the foundation of the earth was laid that he wrote your name down? Are you glad that he wrote your name down? Your raggedy name is written in heaven. Y'all better stop acting like you deserve to have your name in that book. You better stop acting like you got, you better stop acting like you deserve to have your name written in that book. Had he not wrote your name down in his book, you would have got to heaven. And then the righteous judge would have sat on his seat of judgment. Can you imagine that all the good you try to do? 
And because you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and because he hasn't written your name down, that all the good you try to do, that you get to heaven and he looks you square in your face and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. God, I did the whole pay it forward thing when I was on earth. I took groceries to people's house when they needed it. I was, trying, I was kind to everybody. I let them cut me in the highway. And Jesus, and, and God says, Jesus says, depart from me. I don't know you. The beauty of having my name written in that book at my sister's celebration, because it was her celebration, I was just invited. The beauty of it is, I was able to go to a party and a celebration that I didn't pay for. Oh God, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I went to a celebration that I did not pay for. Somebody else paid the price for me. But because I was connected to my sister, because of my relationship with her, because my sister knows a lot of people, but not a lot of people have the relationship that we have. And so when I got to that celebration, I didn't hear, Kendra, you have to depart because your name is not written. When I got there, Lillian said, Come on into the celebration because your sister went ahead of you and wrote your name down in the book. Would you stand to your feet all over this room and just lift your hands? Let's just thank God for a minute for those of us that have our name written in that book. Why don't you just lift your hands and tell God, thank you for writing my name in that book. Now, if your name's not written in that book, keep your hands down because I'm going to talk to you in a minute. But if your name is written, lift your hands and say, God, I really want to tell you thank you for writing my raggedy, trifling name down in that eternal book that you wrote my raggedy name down in your own blood. That while God was forming the worlds, while he was forming the worlds, while he was setting the sun in its socket like a, like a light bulb, while God is telling the ocean just how far up it can come before it has to gently go back. While God is making sure that the sparrow gets a crumb off of your table. That you're thinking about me. While you were thinking about how you would form Mount Everest. You were thinking about the fact that I was going to need you. God, I thank you for writing my name down. Because truth be told, God, I don't deserve to have my name written in that book. I have literally actually done not a single daggone thing in my life to deserve you writing my name down. But thank you for writing my name down. Nah. That of all the things I can accomplish in this life, of all the things we can accomplish in this life, y'all, the greatest accomplishment you could ever make is to get your name in that book. I have a question if you're in this room and you do not know the Lord and the pardon of your sins I want you to come and meet me at this altar so that you can get your name written in this book if you get your name written in this book when you get to heaven when others are in fear because of the great white throne and the judge who sits on it You'll get to heaven and you'll start doing jumping jacks in line like, oh, I can't wait to get my name called. I can't wait. My grandmother used to sing an old song that said, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is, when they start calling names in heaven, my name, Kendall Richard Wyatt, will be called into the record of heaven. If you do not know the Lord, meet me at this altar. Maybe at this altar. 
Come on, meet me at this altar if you don't know the Lord. Will you do me a favor? Will you look at either person on either side of you and ask them, do you know the Lord? Ask them. Y'all looking at me. Don't look at me. Look at the person next to you and say, do you know the Lord and the pardon of your sins? Y'all not doing it at all. Come on, Mount Pleasant. Do you know the Lord? And then wait for an answer. Because don't you want to see that person's face when the roll is called up yonder? So if you don't know the Lord and the pardon of your sins, I want you to meet me at this altar. The second appeal is for those who do not have a church home that would like to connect with this ministry. As Pastor Johnson says, our pastor, if it's right to be in church, then it's wrong to be out of church. So if you don't know the Lord and the pardon of your sins, or if you do not have a church home, meet me at this altar. There's one third appeal I wanna give. That if you are struggling in this room and you just need prayer, you just need the deacons and ministers to pray with you about something and you want to come and do that, you can also meet me at this altar. Is there anyone that needs to be saved? Is there anyone that needs to join?